Good. So, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to find the acceleration of all the masses and tensions in the cables. Okay. There is no friction in the system, which is great because we don't know what friction is yet, which is the thing we are going to learn today. Okay. And the masses are given. The angle of the inclined plane is 45 degrees, so let me write pi over 4 here. So how do I approach any compound mechanical system? I basically analyze it in terms of whatever masses are moving, whatever point masses are moving in that system. So what I need to do here is to draw free body diagrams. All right. So let's start with M1. What are the forces on M1? There is always gravity, right? M1g. And there is a tension in this string. Let me call this tension T1 and the second tension T2, OK? So T1 is pulling it upward. Those are the only forces acting on M1. How about M2? For M2, I have always M2g. But that's not going to matter. Why? Because it will be canceled by the normal force. Right. What other two forces are acting on M2? T1 and T2 are pulling it in opposite directions. T2 is pulling it to the right. T1 is pulling it to the left. What else do I have? I have the third mass, which is on a 45 degree inclined plane. So there is M3g gravity. How about the normal force? The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. That's what normal means, right? So the normal force must be pointing this way. How about, so let me call it N3. How about any other forces acting on this N3? It's tied to the second string, so there's T2 pulling it upward along the inclined plane. Great. So now I need to decide. What are the accelerations of these objects? First of all, all of them are tied to each other with the same string, more or less. If I move one of them, I have to move all of them, right? So if, let's say, M1 is going up with acceleration A, what will be the acceleration of M2? It will be to the right, and it will be A again. How about M3? It will be down along the inclined plane with the acceleration of the same magnitude, right? Do I know if this M1 is going to go up or down? No. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. As long as I write my equations consistently, at the end of today, I indicated that A is up. If I find a negative result, it means that mass is actually going down, right? Excellent. Now let's. See, let's solve the, let's write down the equations. Here, M1A is going to be T1 minus M1G. In the second case, in the normal direction, my mass is not jumping off the plane or going down into the plane. So only acceleration in the horizontal direction matters. So here, M2A is going to be T2 minus T1. How about the third mass? Now I need to actually separate gravity into components because gravitational force into components. So I have M3G sine pi over 4. Because that angle is also pi over 4. right? And M3G cosine pi over 4. So what is M3a? It's going to be M3g sine pi over 4 minus t2. That's it. Now, how many unknowns do I have? Let's see. I don't know what a is. a is one of my unknowns. I don't know what T1 is. I don't know what T2 is. Apart from that, do I know all the quantities? Yes. I have three unknowns. I have three equations. I should be able to solve them without any 
problem. Okay? So, let us give numbers to these equations and if I add them up, add these equations up, on the left hand side, what will I have? I will have m1 plus m2 plus m3 times a and on the right hand side t1 minus m1g plus t2 minus t1 plus what is sine pi over 4? 1 over square root of 2. Okay, so m3g 1 over square root of 2 minus t2 and the reason I am adding all these equations up is that I can actually get rid of both t1 and t2 by adding them up. So apparently a is m3 1 over square root of 2 minus m1 g divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. Quickly, let us check if I reached my goal. My goal is to find the acceleration in terms of given quantities. M1, M2, M3 are given. G is given. So that is great. How about units? What should be the units of A? <coughs> Meters per second square. Here, what is the unit of M3 divided by 1 over square root of 2 minus M1? It is all kilograms, right? All of them are mass. In the denominator, I have M1 plus M2 plus M3. That is also kilograms. So these two cancel. I am left with G, which is also an acceleration. So unit-wise, this is correct, right? And it kind of makes sense, right? If M1 and M3, at some point, the system can move down or up, right? If I choose a particular value of M3 and M1, it should hang in the balance. It should not have any acceleration. And from my equation, I can see that that's when M3 over square root of 2 is equal to M1. That would be the balance condition. But let's actually put in the numerical values and see what the result is. Apparently m3 is 2 point square root of 2 kilograms, m1 is 1 kilogram and m2 is 2 kilograms. So a is 2 minus 1, g is 10 meter per second square. 10 divided by 1 plus 2 plus 2 square root of 2. So all in all, that gives me 1. This gives me 10 divided by 3 plus 2 square root of 2. You could just leave your answer as this. That will also be fine. We generally try to put the roots into the numerator by multiplying it by 3 minus 2 square root of 2, up and down. What would that give me? 10 times 3 plus 2 square root of 2 divided by, here I have 9 minus 8, so it's going to be 30 minus 20 square root of 2 meters per second square. How about the direction? I chose direction to be up. Now I need to decide whether this is a positive number or negative number. Is 30 minus 20 square root of 2 positive or negative? How would you check that? By using a calculator is one choice, but in the exam you will not have access to calculator, so how would you do that? Is 30 larger than 20 square root of 2? I don't know. Let's take the square of both sides. If I take the square of both sides, this is 900. Here I have 400 times 20, so it's 800. Okay? So that's a very easy way to check the square. You don't need the calculator. All right? So, yes, this is larger than zero. So apparently I chose my direction correctly. M1 is moving up. All right? Uh, 
I need to also find the tensions in the ropes. So let's see. Here I have the third equation. The third equation tells me M3A is M3G 1 over square root of 2 minus T2 or T2 is M3 G divided by square root of 2 minus A. Okay, I'll not put in the numerical values. You can do that. How about finding T1? I have not used my second equation, which was M2A was T2 minus T1. I know what T2 is. So I can say T1 is T2 minus M2A. Right? So T1 would be M3 G over square root of 2 minus A minus M2A. I know all the numerical values. I will just plug in what A is, G is, M2 and M1 is, and I'll get the answer. All right? Any questions? No? OK, so we do have a lot of ground to cover today. We have a lot of things to learn. So let's talk about forces in circular motion. Let me remind you that we have actually studied uniform circular motion when we were discussing kinematics, right? So <coughs> uniform circular motion. For example, if I had a mass tied to some rope of length r on a frictionless table, if I actually gave it a velocity v, it will just go around in circles of radius r. Right? What was the most important thing we have actually derived about uniform circular motion? The most important thing to realize here is that although the speed of my mass is constant, its velocity is not. Why? Because velocity was a vector which has a length, which is the speed, and also a direction. And if my particle is going in circles, its velocity is also going in circles, right? At each point, it's actually the magnitude of velocity vector is not changing, but its direction is constantly changing. So the most important thing we have actually learned, maybe this is something you should know by heart, is that if a system is making uniform circular motion with velocity v and radius r, there is an acceleration a. Which way is the acceleration pointing? The acceleration is always pointing towards the center. So we called it centripetal acceleration. What was the value of the centripetal acceleration in terms of V and R? It was V square. Okay. Now, beyond kinematics, I can actually think of dynamics. What is causing this acceleration? If my mass is accelerated, there must be a force causing that acceleration. Well, obviously, why is this mass going around in circles? And Newton tells me that if I actually let a system go without any forces acting on it, it would move on a straight line. It would move with constant velocity. There must be a force making the change in my velocity, making my system, my mass, go in circles. And clearly, I know what the force that force is. That force is the tension in the rope. All right? Now, if the rope breaks, if there is no tension in the rope, what would my particle do? It would just... Move in a straight line. That's most important. No, it will not curve. It will just move in a straight line because 
in that case, there would be no force acting on it. But right now, there is a force acting on it. Let me actually draw the free body diagram for this mass. What are the forces on this mass? There is only one force, because this is the top view. I'm looking at my system, my table from the top. May, well, there is the mg pulling it down, and the table's normal force canceling each other. So I'm not showing those forces, all right? But there is only one force apart from mg and n acting on it. It's the tension of the string. What's the value of that tension? Well, I can easily find it out if I know the mass here, m. What is the acceleration of this object? I just told you that in uniform circular motion, the object has an acceleration towards the center. There is a force towards the center it's caused, which is causing that acceleration. So F must equal ma. So apparently, the tension in the rope is m times v square over r. Now. This extremely simple system is a very good example showing that even with the simplest examples, you can get yourselves confused. Okay. Now, if I'm actually driving my car through a curve, let's say I'm coming from Eskişehir I'm trying to turn to Bilkent. There's a very nasty curve there. All right. What do I feel? Do I feel that there is a force pushing me inward? Or do I actually feel being pushed outward? That's right. When you're inside the car, you're not in an inertial reference system. In other words, you yourself have some acceleration. So whenever a system has acceleration, Newton's second law is not correct in that reference system. F is not equal to MA. There are so-called fictitious forces in such a reference frame. It's actually, it gets hard to analyze that motion, that banking motion of a car from inside the car. We can do it, but we're not going to do it until we study classical mechanics in the second year, okay? Let's stick with reference frames which are not accelerated. Let's stick, stay in the lab frame. That was my advice to you. Try to move solve everything with respect to some fixed system. If I'm at a fixed system, here's what I'm saying. The driver is banking the curve, okay? So it has an acceleration towards the inside, just like the A here, towards the inside of the system. So if he has an acceleration, that acceleration must be caused by a mass, but by a force. Which force is that? It's the force, the car, the seat, the seat belt is applying to that person, right? And that force is into the, it's centripetal, it's towards the center, all right? So please, now, you may have heard about centrifugal force, okay? You may have even solved some problems using it in high school. However, centrifugal force is something we call fictitious force in, a, in an accelerating reference frame. So it gets really hard to use that reference frame, especially if there are more than one masses in, your, in the system, okay? So my advice to you, please, please forget about centrifugal force, okay? It's the force you feel, okay? <laughs> Do your analysis in a frame which is not accelerated. Do your analysis with respect to the center of the system, with respect to, the, to someone actually sitting still or going with constant velocity, okay? Instead, always do your analysis, you know that there is an acceleration and there is a force 
the force and acceleration are centripetal. They are towards the center. All right? Otherwise, you can get really, really confused. Okay? You'll get some terribly wrong results. Now, let's solve one example. You know, this connection from Eskişehir yolu to Bilkent, uh, İhsan Doğramacı Bulvar, it's a terrible curve. There are accidents almost every week there. Especially there's an accident, there are accidents, if the road is iced, if we are deep in winter. So let's say that due to icing, the curve has zero friction. So that's a terrible condition. And let's also make the system a little bit simpler. Let's say that it's a quarter of a circle curve. Okay. If I look at the system from the top, and let's say that the radius from some center is R. So I'm actually going to do quarter of a circle of R with my car. And I'll pass through the curve with velocity V. Now, if this curve is flat, so if I actually do the curve on an even ground, and if there is no friction, can I actually turn the curve? No, it's not possible. If there is no friction, the ground is not going to apply any force on me. Newton tells me the only thing I can do is actually I'll just go straight. So that's one kind of accident which happens, right? You just go straight out of the curve. But can I make this curve a little bit safer? Maybe I can actually make it so that even at zero friction, I can turn through that curve. What I need to do is not make the curve in a even ground, but give some, give it some inclination. Okay, so if I look at the system from the side, what I'll see is that my curve will not be flat, but the car actually, as making an angle theta with the horizontal. Now, in this case, what I would like to find out is, if the angle is theta, what is the safe speed that I can pass through the curve without any friction, OK? So find the safe speed for which this car goes through the curve without sliding sideways. Hmm. How can we do that? Let's maybe zoom in a little bit more on this. So here is my car. Now, the first question I'd like to ask is, what are the forces on this car? Let's see. What are the forces acting on this car? Okay. There is always gravity. So uh, let's say there is mg. What else? 
There is the normal force, right? I'm not sinking into the uh, into the pavement, right? So there must be a force which is actually normal to that direction. So essentially, that angle is also theta. What else? Are there any other forces? Well, normally there would be friction on the road, but I said this is IC condition, so there is no friction. Another thing is, if I'm being realistic, there would be air friction. But let's ignore that also. Okay? Uh, any other forces? Okay, so here's the thing. The centripetal force is not a force that actually appears by itself. Okay, we'll see that the centripetal force is already contained in these forces. Do not invent a new force. That's that's the that's the point I'm trying to make. Okay, here it's very simple. If I did not tell you that this system was going through a curve, those would be the only two forces you tell me are acting on the system, mg and the normal force, right? If I put something on an inclined plane, that's all you tell, and you stop there. That's it. There is no other force acting on the system in the lab frame. All right? Now let's see. Does this system have an acceleration? Yes, it does. From the top view, I know that when you're actually banking a curve, when you're going through a curve, there is a centripetal acceleration with the magnitude v squared over r. All right, so which way is the acceleration in this? Not top view, but the side view. The acceleration is to the left, horizontally to the left. Okay, so let's analyze my motion in the x-axis and in the y-axis. In the y-axis, is there an acceleration? Is this car going up or down? There is no acceleration in the y-axis. In the y-direction, there is no acceleration. So m times a y is 0. What are the forces in the y-direction? I need to take the components, look at the components of the normal force. This is going to be n cosine theta. The other component will be n sine theta. So n cosine theta minus mg. In other words, n would be mg divided by cosine theta. Good. How about the x-direction? There, there is only one force there. The force is n times sine theta. And that's equal to m a. So here it is. Your centripetal force is just the x component of your normal force, the normal force of the surface is actually supplying the force that's enough for you to turn through this bank. All right? Good. So, now the nice thing is I know what N is. So, I also know what A is. A is V squared over R. So, let me write everything in terms of givens. Sine theta is m times v squared over r. m's canceled. I was asked to find the safe speed. v squared is r times g times tangent theta, or v is square root of r g tangent theta. Did I reach my goal? 
Yes, what was given in the problem? V, R, well, V was asked, R was given, theta was given, and we know G. Excellent. How about units? What's the unit of R? Meters. What's the unit of G? Meter per second, square. What's the unit of tangent theta? Doesn't have units. Square root of meter square per second, square is meter per second, which is the unit for V, so unit wise here, okay. How about the safe speed? Do you think that safe, the safe speed will be higher or lower if the radius is larger? If I have a large radius, it should be easier to go through it with a large speed, right? So with, when R goes to infinity, V should go to infinity. So as a limit, R goes to infinity, V goes to infinity, checks. How about tangent theta? I said if theta was zero, so if it was just a flat curve, then when there is no friction, there is no way to safely pass through it, which means V should be zero, right? So let's check that when theta goes to zero, tangent theta is zero, V is zero, so that also makes sense, all right? It's great. It means that I actually have uh, the correct limits, so most probably I've actually found the correct answer. All right? Let me tell you, give you one more example about these fictitious forces, and you'll understand why this centripetal force is no different from another force you actually know very well. Now that we are talking about cars, let's actually do one more example. Let's say this is your car. Looks like a limousine, but okay. And you're a very fancy driver. So let's say there is a, I don't know, dice hanging from your, your uh, rear view mirror, okay? So let me zoom in. Here is your rear view mirror, and here is your dice. So at some point, you see that the dice is making an angle, theta, with the vertical. Okay, so let's say dice. Let's say. Okay. Now, the question is, if the dice hanging from your mirror is making an angle theta as shown, what is the direction and magnitude of the acceleration of your car? Hmm. What are the forces acting on the dice here? Let's, let's say the dice has M, mass MD. There is always gravity, MDG. What other force is there? It's only tied by a single string, so there is a force tension T. Now, which way is the acceleration? Clearly, this dice is not going up or down, okay? Unless you have a flying car, right? So, according to someone sitting outside the car, according to someone who's outside, the only thing they see is that there is no acceleration in the vertical plane. So, it means that the forces in the vertical direction cancel each other. So, T, and that angle was theta, T, Cosine theta must be equal to m dice times g. 
no acceleration in vertical direction. In this case, what's the only force acting on my dice? It's T sine theta. So T sine theta must be equal to m dice times acceleration, right? Apparently, the acceleration of the car and the dice, they are not moving with respect to each other, right? Is to the left. What's the value of this acceleration that was asked? Now I know what t is. t is m dice times g divided by cosine theta times sine theta is m dice, not mg. Dice times a. So apparently, a is g times tangent theta to the left. Which means, if according to my drawing, my acceleration is to the left. So this is, let's say, this is the front of the car, right? Because my rear view mirror is there. So this car is decelerating. It's actually slowing down. It's, uh, and when you're actually slowing down, you know that your dice goes forward, right? The, an interesting thing to do is if you actually have a helium balloon, right? When you, when you actually press the brake inside, the, for if you have a floating balloon, it moves the other way. It's, it's, it's quite uh, nice. Try that uh, if, you, if you actually buy a balloon. There's a question. That is also, yes, I mean, if you, if you are in the reverse gear, then you can actually accelerate and get an acceleration like that. Then also the dice will also go forward. I somehow assume that your velocity is in the forward direction, okay? But you're absolutely correct. The only thing that this dice can tell me is which way the acceleration is pointing. It cannot tell me anything about the velocity. Let's take a 10-minute break. When we come back, let's talk about friction. <laughs>